I'm pleased to be here. First time in Kazakhstan, and I hope it certainly won't be the last. So greetings. Uh, yes, I am ca uh, Canadian, but I'm not representing Canada here. I hope to represent the attachment-based developmental approach. But greetings to distinguished guests, to all the conference participants. Um, and uh, what I do hope uh, to share with you, and I'm pleased to be invited to share my perspective uh, here, is more on the student side of things rather than the teaching uh, side of things. We're all concerned about the student uh, teacher equation. We all want our teaching uh, to translate into a student's learning. In my conversations with educators across Canada and uh, many other countries, many of them will say, especially those who have been in the field for 30 or 40 years or so, that teaching is actually getting harder. Th this, despite incredible advances in pedagogy, in curriculum, uh, having the best trained teachers ever, and of course, incredible, incredible advances in technology. And so, uh, from this, I would suspect that the problem lies more on the student side of the equation. And I do believe that students are actually changing all around the world. And this is, uh, if we could understand this, if we could make sense of this, we may be able to address, from that point of view, the challenges of education. So I've, I've entitled uh, my address, the uh, Keynotes to the Well-Being of Students. The question could be asked, of course, is how do we know if a student is doing well? I don't mean just in terms of marks, but how do we know if a child is, is doing well? And congratulations uh, to Nish for all of its concern for the emotional well-being of the student as well. I think this is so important. But how do we know? How do we know? Uh, my mind goes to an analogy. I'm a gardener. I come from Vancouver and uh, do gardening on, on my spare time. And uh, I love going for walks in the spring and looking at the various specimens of flowering shrubs and I'm, I'm always very interested to see a particular flower, a particular shrub, uh, a particular plant absolutely flourishing, being all that it could be. In fact, there's a whole new psychology which is around that construct of flourishing. Instead of studying illness, disease, instead of going from the model, the question is, is what is required? What are the conditions that are required for children to flourish, for students to flourish? And I'd like to take that, take a look at that for a minute to address this problem. Uh, flourish, first of all, uh, to grow well or luxurious, lu luxuriantly, to thrive, to grow and develop in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as a result of favorable conditions. So the idea here, from a developmental point of view, Development is spontaneous. The realization of, of our potential as human beings happens. It just happens. It's not something we teach. It, it happens. It's spontaneous, but it is not inevitable. And that is the human condition, of course, that none of us can help growing older, but we don't all grow up. And it seems there are a whole lot of us that aren't growing up. And that is one of the concerns, true, uh, what does true maturation look like? What does it mean to realize our potential as human beings? Well, very quickly, very quickly, if we take a look at it, what does it look like in terms of a human, a student? How would we see it? Uh, there are a number of things that, uh, that would stand out. First of all, some viability as a separate being. They'd be able to think for themselves. They'd be able to uh, have their own ideas. Uh, they'd be able to make their own decisions, have their own values, preferences, have a sense of agency, a viability as a separate being. Secondly, they'd be able to adapt to circumstances beyond their control. Uh, this is incredibly important. This is a potential, not an inevitabil inevitability. 
just because a, a child is 12, 15, uh, we're 50 years of age does not mean uh, that we're either functioning as a separate being or we're adapting to the circumstances that we can't control. Uh, thirdly, a social being, and by that don't mean simply that we can get along with others, uh, but more that we're capable of being ourselves while at the same time uh, being able to preserve the capacity for togetherness with others. A huge dominant need, and what I will address primarily here, is the factors of attachment and maturation in the learning equation. Looking at it from the student point of view and answering the question then is what is happening uh, with our students in this way. And so maturity would be, uh, realizing our potential would be, uh, being able to do togetherness and separateness simultaneously, having integrity without the loss of diplomacy or diplomacy without the loss of integrity. Now, those of you who are married know how hard doing uh, togetherness and separateness at the same time is. Uh, some of us will be working on our second and third marriages to try and figure this out. It's not an easy task, but this, however, is our, our possibility to be a separate being, an adaptive being, and a social being. Uh, so how does this happen? Is this taught? Uh, can, uh, if going to the right schools, would this happen? Is this a, a function of intelligence? No, you could have somebody with an IQ of, of 160, be absolutely brilliant, a genius, and not be viable as a separate being, show no signs of adaptation and show no signs of integrative functioning whatsoever. Is going to the right schools the answer? Now, and, and, and again, we could have all kinds of examples of this. You could have three PhDs from the top universities in the world and still not show true maturation uh, in this. And so what is it? it? The more we look at it, the more we see that nature already had a plan, a template, the unfolding of human potential, responsibility of three processes, uh, that which used to be called the uh, individuation process or differentiation process, and now being called more the emergent process across all levels, biology, uh, physiology, uh, psychology, the adaptive process which involves encounters with futility being highly moved by that which we cannot change. When mother says no, uh, when grandma is dying, uh, when there's uh, not a second story tonight, any, anything that when we come up against something we cannot change for the child, uh, that we're, uh, we're moved by that, we feel the futility of it. And that's remarkable. They discovered in terms of the emotion of futility that if we feel it, the amygdala, it was mentioned this morning, the command center of the limbic system sends signals to the lacrimal glands and the eyes water. Now, humans can cry for all kinds of things, but these tears of futility are a very special kind of tear that mark the transition from trying to make something work to resting from it working. And it ends up to be that these tears play a huge story in the journey of, hu of human adaptation. That when we suffer great losses under stress, that there must be some sadness, some disappointment about the things we cannot change uh, for adaptation to occur. Who knew? Who knew this wasn't something we could learn? You can't teach this in school. It's not a skill that it is. It is in some very tender feelings. And the integrative process, developing as a result of inner conflict, dissonance, and discord. This is all the study these days in neuroscience. The prefrontal cortex is that when, when our feelings actually mix, uh, when a child can say, part of me feels this way and part of me feels that way, on the other hand, or they feel ambivalence, no four-year-old can do this. There isn't a four-year-old in the world who can say, well, part of me is mad at you right, uh, right now, mommy. I'd like to hit you, but I really love you, you know. Uh, they, they never say, on the, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, there is no ambivalence. You even know some world leaders who don't show any inner conflict or dissonance. And so this isn't just the preschooler. that You could be 70 years of age and show none. But this is the integrative process. So you would, sign, you would see signs of this. You could ask very simply, if you were asking, you know, what does it look like for a student to be doing well? Can they move from mad to sad? Do they respond to losses, to lacks in their life? 
Uh, do they show in their writing and their poetry uh, the, uh, the keen sense of disappointment when up against the things that do not work? Is there evidence of them wanting to be their own person, think for themselves? Uh, do you see movement towards that? Uh, do you see that? That would be true for the three-year-old. It would be true for the 13-year-old. Uh, these are true wherever it is. And is there some evidence in their writing, in their poetry, in their art, in their talk of, of having a prefrontal cortex that is up and running uh, that they can say, on the other hand, that there's evidence of inner conflict? If there's evidence of this, you know that they are thriving in the sense that there is well-being, at least in looking at it from uh, on the unfolding of human potential. These three processes, it turns out, have a tremendous amount of fruit. Vitality, a sense of agency, interest and curiosity and so on, I won't go through all of these but a tremendous amount of fruit. The adaptive process includes learning from mistakes, which is not inevitable. Our curriculum is based that upon the fact that students can learn from mistakes, and we find out that it is not inevitable. In fact, you'll know even staff who will not learn from their mistakes, adults who don't learn from their mistakes, and certainly many students who don't learn from their mistakes. Uh, the integrative process, well-tempered, considered and civilized, balanced perspective. Uh, this is what we call emotional maturity and all the ele levels that are there, which are a result of this process. Now the thing is, is you can't teach these things. If a, if a child, if a student comes into your school doors with these fruit, that child is incredibly receptive to your teaching. You could use emergent pedagogy, you could use adaptive pedagogy, you could do, use a dialectic, you could use almost any pedagogies and they would benefit from it. And they could benefit from most any teacher in any program in any system. However, if a, if a child does not demonstrate these fruit, and these aren't genetic, and again, if you tried to reinforce curiosity, you'd make it go away. You can teach a child to act like this. You can't teach a child to be like this. You can't teach an adult to be like this. This is the key. This is what it would look like if you have a, a, a child of yours going to university and they get a reference with these characteristics, it would make you feel very proud indeed. This would be amazing to have this. This is what it looks like for a student to thrive, is that you see these. Now, if we take a look at that, within that, within the process of the spontaneous unfolding of human potential, when conditions are conducive, there lies the potential of learning as well. Might look at it in this way, from the emergent, these things come in the research as some of the highest, a sense of agency and responsibility in the learning process full of interest and curiosity about the world around them, the world that they're not attached to. That child is teachable in most any kind of program, in any kind of way. Now you increase the, the, the uh, uh, efficiency of the program and of course you'll get benefit. Uh, but more and more of our students do not seem to be showing up with, these, with the attributes that would make them teachable. Uh, learns from mistakes, obviously, because that's what we do in school is we correct them. And uh, learns from dissonance, that's so important. If they can't learn from a sense of dissonance, uh, they, they don't really get the essence of math, essence of science, essence of social studies, uh, the essence of so many things. And they, don't, they aren't able to do togetherness without loss of separateness. So these things are absolutely important. If you can think of it this way, what a child needs to bring to school for learning to result, uh, represented by the backpack here, is this. They need to bring this to school. And if they bring this to school, they make us look good. If we have a lot of students coming to school with these attributes, they make our system look good, they make uh, the teacher look good, they make, you know, they make us look good. I call it the teachability factor, that they are very receptive to our teaching. I'm concerned that less and less of our children are coming to school this way. And that is making teaching harder rather than easier, despite 
all our advances in curriculum, despite all having the best trained teachers ever, uh, despite the best honed curriculum ever, um, and pedagogy, and so on. And so what needs to happen then at home for children to realize their full learning potential at school? Uh, we heard this morning presented that the most significant factors in the education equation, in the learning equation, don't have to do with school at all. And I'm absolutely convinced they don't have to do with school. But that doesn't mean we can't do something about that. I think we can. I think we can. But they don't have to do with school. What needs to happen at home? Well, very quickly, there has to be some rest and relief from the most significant need we have. That attachment is equivalent to survival in all mammals. The, the, the limbic system goes for the very simple algorithm, unlike the reptilian brain, is that uh, probability of survival lies in proximity with those we are attached to, those who take care of us. It makes attachment the absolute preeminent need. And our children are becoming preoccupied with it with no rest and relief. All growth happens in the rest from that predominant dynamic. I'll unfold that a little bit. Secondly, the ability to feel tender emotion. We now distinguish in neuroscience between feelings and emotions. We need to feel our emotions. We are full of emotions, but we need to feel our emotions to become fully human and humane. A remarkable number of our students are losing their emotions. In Canada, we have direct evidence of our students learning their, losing their feelings. They're not feeling their emotions. And, and this has dire results. And thirdly, the whole new science of play is coming in is that true play, that which is not work, not for real, is expressive. And that doesn't include video games. It doesn't include many of the sports activities anymore because they're outcome-based. These are not outcome-based. Is where all, the, all nature does all its work. In fact, many are calling now nature, or sorry, play, nature incognito. It's where it does its work in a completely what was a thought to be innocuous activity. And so if we look at the attachment part of it, and I come back to the plant here, the flourishing plant, with the idea of maturation over top when, or on top of the ground, when, when we put all the pieces together here, uh, we, uh, we, we find, and that's my job as a theorist to put the pieces together, that the first six years of a child's life are primarily about uh, developing the capacity for relationships so the child can hold on when apart. Uh, because to face separation causes the most stress uh, to, to our brain, to our system. That is the very essence of stress. And so nature is invested in being able to help us hold on when apart. So this is incredible. It starts off with being with. It goes to being like. And we find that the being like, the sameness, is the key to the acquisition of all language for all mammals and for birds. It's very simple. We make the noises like those to whom we're attached. And one of the problems that, uh, it, uh, that are pr problems with literacy is, is simply is that children are no longer attached to the teachers who are trying to teach them language. And that is a hugely significant problem. This isn't about method. It's not about reading half an hour a day to a child. It's about a, a child being read to by somebody they're attached to. All of this has to do with attachment dynamics. In other words, it's not the program, it's not the method, it's the relationship of the child to the person who is trying to influence them, is, is trying to interact. And that's the hidden thing. Nobody talks about that. And yet that seems to be more important than anything else, is that relationship. It goes to belonging and loyalty. A child interprets by the third year of life, should interpret closeness as being part of and also being on the same side as. Uh, this this has huge implications. It should go by the fourth year to a sense of significance, a mattering, of being special and important to. Now the child has at least three ways of holding on when apart. And it should go by the fifth year into, into emotional intimacy. Uh, Freud had already got distracted by sex uh, when he discovered this. And he called it the Oedipal or Electra complex. It's not about a child wanting to have sex with mom and dad. It's about a child wanting to be able to hold on to them forever. And if they marry you and, and proposition you, they're not exclusive about it. The right answer to them is not I'm already married, thank you. Uh, the right answer would be don't you worry, uh, honey. I'll hold on to you forever because that's what nature is trying to do. Nature is trying to create a scenario 
where the connection is unbroken. And this isn't about being with all the time. This is about being able to develop a capacity for relationship. And finally, if it goes and unfolds and there's continuity, now a child can, can share all that is within his heart or wants to share all that is within his heart to be seen and heard from the inside. Well, this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal. These are roots reaching out. Uh, this is the preoccupation of, of children, of adults. This is what we're all about unless we get some release. And so somebody has to step up to the plate. This is a seeking mode. And you can seek and your whole life can be consumed with all of these issues, the issues of attachment. But the real issue for children is does somebody... Does somebody step out of the plate? Does somebody step up to the plate and say, I am your answer here. I am the answer to your needs for significance, for belonging, to invite you to exist in my presence. I am the answer for your, your needs, for, for, uh, for being with, for being like. A child needs at least one person in their life this way. So many of our children, or so many of our students don't have anybody anymore. They don't have a grandma. They don't have a mom. They don't have a dad that is doing this this kind of work and if that work isn't done you don't see a flourishing child that's got to happen someplace now that's not school work that's homework that's homework but as our culture changes as as our culture we lose the conditions for raising children schools suffer and schools are suffering basically because they're not coming to our doors uh, as teachable as they used to be, which means that with all our improvements, uh, teaching is still getting harder. Uh, the ability to feel tender emotion. And again, neuroscience is having to differentiate between emotion and feelings. Feelings, it turns out, are the feedback of what is happening in our body. And so that's a luxury. Feelings are a luxury. Uh, and the, the brain isn't invested in us feeling if they get hurt too much. And so what happens here is, is, is th these feelings and very pivotal feelings, feelings of sadness, it turns out, feelings of fulfillment, it turns out, and feelings of inner conflict are what drive the engine of maturation. And so you can see what is missing exactly in those kids that are immature, that are very immature for age 15-year-olds, that are, that are really have the emotional maturity of a 4-year-old instead of a 15-year-old. And they're missing these kinds of feelings uh, that would move them to mature. Now, uh, the brain is totally equipped to be able to block out our feelings. Thankfully, my brain is blocking it out right now. I can't afford to feel. The reason I can't afford to feel is the main reason that the brain blocks out feelings is because I've got work to do. I'm a very shy person. When I first of all started teaching at university, I had days of diarrhea before every lecture. Then finally you run out of that. And, uh, and I would feel terribly exposed. And I had nightmares of turning up like this and finding out I wasn't dressed. Uh, nightmares of being exposed for years and years and years. Uh, fortunately, my brain pr uh, protected me, and, and I found out I was standing in classes like this, theaters at UBC, University of British Columbia, and lecturing to my students. And I couldn't feel my hunger. I couldn't feel my tiredness. I didn't feel my aches and pains. And I realized I didn't feel my feelings as, as well. But fortunately, when I got home to my loved ones, to my family, as, as soon as I made contact, I could feel my tiredness. All my feelings came back. Now, we find that as long as there's an end of the day, as long as there's an end of the week, our soldiers come home, uh, they get their feelings back. As long as there's this, our students come home. Uh, if you're in a wounding environment, uh, they get their feelings back all is well. The problem is, is for many of our students, for many of those in, in uh, living in, or working in stressful situations, there's no end of the day. There's no end of the week. And what we find when there's no end of the week is these, these defenses get stuck. And when they get stuck, when they get stuck, we have an incredible loss of feelings. And we look at those in the prison system, and, uh, and they have about 80% less feelings than others. We find out very, they lose their feeling of being satiated, loved, enjoyed, wanted. So nothing is ever enough. 
Nothing is ever enough. And uh, before you can feel full, you have to be able to feel empty. We find many children who can no longer say, I miss, I feel needy. They're losing their feelings. But we're not noticing that because we're focused on their behavior and on their marks. We're not noticing that. Uh, feelings of caring are going missing. It, this is incredible research in Canada that 40% less empathy in one generation. 40% less. And the research shows that when children lose their blush, embarrassment, they lose their feeling of, of caring. This isn't a skill to be taught. We, we care deeply. This is an attachment uh, emotion to care about that which we're attached to. It is a loss of feeling and is fundamentally changing in our children, changing their sexuality, uh, changing, uh, changing their behavior, changing uh, how they see things. And so, and feelings of alarm, the greatest uh, indication of, of uh, or, uh, or uh, predictor of adolescent violence is a four-year-old who can no longer say, I'm scared. But again, we've been looking at behavior and not feelings. We need feelings to become fully human and humane. All the science of, of uh, the flourishing child is putting uh, feelings on the foreground. So what is happening is, is our children, many of them, are equipped to function in wounding environments, a flight from vulnerability. There's a loss of empathy, which of course leads to more wounding. And then we see a spin-off as we get developmental arrest, alarm problems, anxiety problems, agitation problems, aggression problems, drugs, suicide, and bullying. And the way I see it, there are three things that are, are happening. Children are experiencing more separation than ever before. The, the direct stress factor, peer orientation, is what I talk about in my book, is when children now are, are more likely to replace, uh, to revolve around their peers at the same age rather than the adults who are meant to care for them. Uh, this doesn't serve survival. There's great stress in this. The more they matter, the more they get they, their feelings hurt. And uh, so we get this fight from vulnerability. And of course, the digital playground is an incredibly cruel playground. Uh, even Facebook is an incredibly cruel playground. And so we've got this cycle, which is affecting everyone now uh, tremendously. Now, this realization of human potential, as I said, there's one more part to this play, which is now a, a completely new science, uh, joining about eight uh, complete, uh, different academic disciplines. That play is where all the head start is. Uh, play is where nature does its work. That is true play. Uh, that play is needed for emotions as, as well as for the networking and the development of the brain. If you notice at this, if we looked at it in this way, and this includes a learning potential, we now have three signs, really three signs of optimal functioning. Uh, playfulness, and that's becoming more and more an indicator of the sign of emotional and mental health, is playfulness. In fact, when they study the brain under depression, it is exactly the opposite of playfulness of the brain under playfulness. And most of the diagnosis we have, there's a distinct lack of playfulness. You can even know when your cat gets better, when they've had a trauma and so on, uh, when they start playing. It ends up to be a universal symbol for all mammals is this playfulness, restfulness, because all growth happens from a place of rest, a true rest. There's even a whole half of the autonomic nervous system that is committed to this. And soft hearts, just simply an intuitive term for being able to feel your tender emotions. And all of this is grounded by right relationships here. So what the immature require in order to see, succeed in school, here's the problem, is, is our children, there seems to be more and more immaturity in our system, in our society. And as there's more immaturity, is, is the conditions aren't there for children to grow up. They're not getting the conditions they need. It's not conducive. They're coming in non-emergent, non-adaptive, and non-integrative. What do we do with them? And I think that is the question that we have to ask school systems all around the world. If we don't get this right in Canada, we'll be going down in the ratings. And uh, if we don't get this right, we need to get this right. And what they need, and there is still hope, a huge hope in this, but the answer is so simple, so simple and so profound. What, it, what is, and again, it is an issue of relationship, an issue of attachment, is the most significant factor of all in the learning equation is that is a relationship to the teacher. Because when the relationship is there to the teacher, 
Attachment is the most powerful force in the universe. We are meant to learn in the context of attachment about what we are attached to and the things that serve our attachment needs, and that's true for all mammals, not just humans, is that that more than compensates for the lack of maturation. And it would seem then... It would seem then that this would provide the way through. Now, there's three reasons that stuck kids need to be attached to their teachers. Again, it's a powerful force, but there are some instincts, attachment instincts, that we discovered. For instance, shyness. It was perceived as social anxiety. And now we realize that it's an attachment instinct. We're never shy with those to whom we're attached. We're only shy outside of our attachment. In fact, shyness is simply meaning reserved for one's people. But shyness is, 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 uh, is a huge dynamic in the education system because it meant that children were only meant to be taught within the context of their relationships uh, of, of the attachment uh, in the context of... Um, of their own village of attachment. That is who they were attached to. So shyness can cripple, absolutely cripple this, a counter will, which I'll mention, and of course the huge desire to be good, uh, which already is evidenced by three years of age and follows absolutely attachment. But just a bit more about shyness. An instinctive resistance to proximity in order to protect existing working attachments. Shows up, it turns, by about five months of life and becomes huge in this. We have been disregarding this. Uh, in, in, and uh, early, early research on intelligence showed is that when shy children were given intelligence tests by strangers, by somebody that they weren't comfortable with, it could dumb them down by over 20 IQ points which means that shyness is crippling our school system. It's the silent crippler here because shy children are only meant to function inside of those attachments, unless they grow out of it, of course. They're emergent, adaptive, and integrative. When they're emergent, adaptive, and integrative, uh, they can be taught by teachers who don't even know their name. Uh, they can be taught by strangers because they've got three growing edges uh, which can be uh, turned into, into teaching edges uh, for these children, learning edges. So about being reserved for one's people, when attachments to peers are incompatible with attachments to adults, this defense cripples learning in the school system. We misinterpret it. When, when three and four-year-olds and five-year-olds become attached to their peers, they become very social. We thought it was social development. On closer look, it ends up to reversal of shyness. And so they lose their shyness with each other, but then they become shy towards the adults in their life which ultimately cripples their learning because they're learning more from their peers at recess and on the playground than they are from the adults in the classroom. And so this is one reason why if children are not emergent, adaptive, and integrative, they need to be attached to their teachers. And counter will. It turns out that children were not born to do our bidding after all. They were not born saying, I'm so glad I will have teachers to tell me what to do and what to think. They were not born saying, I'm so glad I'll have parents who will teach me right and wrong. Of course not. In fact, it turns out that we have an instinct to resist coercion. We have an instinct to resist influence. We don't even have a, 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 we don't even have a term for this in English. I had to borrow this from German and Otto Rank, uh, 19th century, uh, uh, made up this term in German. You can make up anything in German, actually. Uh, and made this up. I don't know whether it is in Kazakh or not, this idea. Uh, we call it oppositionality. We call it resistance. It's a whole lot more than this. Uh, but this, this counter will is simply there to protect uh, from being told what to do, told what to think, told how to live, from being pushed around by those that we're not attached to or if we're not directly engaged in attachment. You can try this out. Uh, you can go, uh, if you have kids, uh, before you collect them in the morning, before you get their eyes, smiles and nods, before you actually engage their attachment instincts, just tell them to hurry up and see if they don't slow down. Yeah, tell them they have to do this and see if they you know, uh, don't resist. In fact, you can try it on your spouse and see how it works. 
None of us likes being pushed around, told what to do, except if we're, our attachment instincts are engaged and then it trumps it. We were protected, nature protected us against outside influence, which is school. Which is school. And so counter will cripple school. It's probably why we're the most inefficient business around. The business would never exist if it operated as inefficiently as schools do. Because shyness and counter will absolutely cripples this. And so we're going to have to. We're going to have to get into the attachment business, whether we like it or not. We're going to have to harness the power of attachment. The attachment instinct is designed to protect against being influenced by those outside of one's village. The more immature the student, the less driven by the counter will instinct. This doesn't affect mature students. The problem here, and what I'm trying to, demo, uh, to say, is, is the evidence would seem to indicate that our children are not growing up. That's what it would seem to indicate. Robert Bly in Sibling Society, the poet laureate or uh, honorary poet laureate of American Society of America of, of the U.S. Uh, stated that his analysis of what was going on in American society, in North American so society, is a loss of maturity. We're not growing up. And with this, counterwill and shyness begins to cripple our system. Counterwill cripples learning and immature students who are not attached to their teachers. They automatically resist, do the opposite, work to rule, and so on. And that's why probably Plato, way back, said, do not keep children to their studies by compulsion, but by play. Uh, this would have been in the context, of course, is where students were not are taught by those to whom they were attached. Which brings us then to the desire to be good, one of the most phenomenal motivations in humans. But it's so simple, even for us as adults, we only feel like being good for those to whom we are attached. But if we're adaptive, if we're emergent, if we're integrative functioning, we know when we must, we know when we do, and the futility of not being good uh, in certain circumstances. The non-emergent, the non-adaptive, the non-integrative don't know that. And, it mean, and this desire to be good means everything. My own five children uh, did very well in school. My own six grandchildren are doing well as well. I have one son who is a neuroscientist now, graduated from Harvard, uh, top of his class, done very well. But I could see the difference for him all the way through his school when he was attached to his teacher. He put in the extra work, the extra effort to do in his projects and all of those things. Why? Out of relationship. He wanted to do good by that teacher. He put everything into it and it probably made the difference between going to Ivy League universities or other universities is that extra effort that he did all about this is a powerful, powerful uh, motivation. And, it, and again, the, non, the emergent, the adaptive, the maturing student doesn't need this. They have their own reasons for learning. But for those students who are not, then this is our only hope for them. Students are naturally inclined to follow those to whom they're attached, attend to, feel at home with, assume the form of, predisposed to talk like, feel like being good for, inclined to agree with, most likely to take direction from, open to influence from, and seek to measure up to the expectations of those to whom they are attached. Phenomenal power of attachment. The answer then, the challenge for today's school systems would be to, if there was one place that we were going to invest, one place to increase the efficiency of our system, one place to throw a net so children don't fall through the attachment cracks, one place to compensate for the fact that we're getting more and more unteachable students, one way to reach the unteachable, to render them receptive to our teaching, would be to invest in student-teacher relationships. It wouldn't cost that much. What it requires is the desire, the will. What it requires is, is the willingness to be able to cultivate that. We all know, those of us who have students or uh, children going to school, that in the first couple of weeks of school, we wait with bated breath not to find out where the teacher got their education. Not to find out you know, what PhD they have or what's new on the curriculum this year. We wait with bated breath to find out one simple thing only, 
Does a child like the teacher and think the teacher likes them? And that actually is going to be the greatest predictor of their academic performance and their behavior in that year. It is a matter of student-teacher relationships, and we can do a whole lot about that. There is very much we can do about it. I'll end just with this anecdote. I'm, I'm sure most of you know it. Uh, the story is told on Socrates, who of course had this incredible Socratic method. Talk all about a method that is superior learning. And uh, in it, the, the tradition uh, tells us that he was challenged. He was challenged on this particular uh, time about uh, the fact that his method failed with this particular student. And his retort is said that he immediately retorted and said, I couldn't teach him. He didn't love me. Interesting defense. Interesting defense. Uh, for someone who was able to give us the Socratic method, for him to realize that it was all context dependent. We're involved in teaching, but the context in which we teach is so significant. When the context, when children have developed a working relationship with the teacher, with those that are educating, uh, educating them, they are far more receptive to our teaching. Again, uh, this is for those who are non-emergent, non-adaptive, not showing the fruit of, uh, of well-being, of emotional well-being, of maturation. If they're showing the fruit of that, again, it doesn't really matter. Uh, they, they can be taught by complete strangers. Uh, they have lots of ways of learning, lots of interest and curiosity about this, and, uh, and most they will make us look good with virtually any method. Well, I hope this material makes sense to you. It's, a, again, a different way of looking at this problem, the student side of the equation. Uh, uh, again, in summary, uh, that, my, that in, in studying this from the student side of it, my concern is that students are changing. Uh, my concern is, is that we're not responding to that. We're getting more and more unteachable students, making our teaching harder. Uh, be, and, uh, and the answer is not so much in our teaching. The answer is in creating the context in which we can teach. I hope this will contribute uh, to your discussions during this conference. Thank you.